We're glad you joined us for another Grace Story in our series called Grace Stories, where we hear what God is doing in people's life, what He's done, how His grace has changed them, and I think you'll enjoy today's story. Uh, this is uh, one of our podcast series. Every other week, you'll hear a teaching or a discussion about theology. But I, I like stories, and as I, my mom always used to say, everybody has a story. And I think they're very interesting stories. And I think you'll be interested in the story that you hear today. And if you'll especially be interested because we you recently heard her husband, Pastor Gary Armstrong's, his story. And now we're interviewing his wife, Chayla Armstrong, because we want to make sure he told the truth about everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Chayla, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Here's my first question. I've never met anybody named Chayla, so where did that name come from or what does it mean? It me means consolation. Yeah. and In what language? Spanish. Okay, I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah, I and mean, I'm uh, part Mexican, so it's a, uh, I don't know that I'm exactly a, a consoling person, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's what it means. Do you speak Spanish? Uh, a little bit. I'm not, definitely not fluent and I uh, took some in high school, but yeah. When I tell people I'm half Chinese, I just have to say, all I can do is use chopsticks. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. <laughs> can count and, you know, maybe ask a few questions. <laughs> so how do you like being the wife of a pastor? It is great. It's just perfect every day. Life is... Yeah, perfect. That's yeah. what Gary said. That's yeah. why you're here to... to yeah, to, absolutely. To, we're going to vet out the truth here. Um, did you listen to Gary's podcast? I did. And you, you thought it was all truthful. I did. <laughs> Actually, I did. I, you know, the most endearing thing was, and it's, it was so cute. Um, anytime he, I heard him talk about me, I could like hear him smile through the podcast. Oh, really? It was so sweet. Yeah. You could hear him smile through the podcast. You know, if you can hear someone smile, I thought I heard him smile. That's right. You know, when you do smile and talk on the phone or something, it changes your, your whole tone. Yeah. And um, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Well, that's good. So, um, let's see. So, Gary's story uh, told us about a pretty rough background that he had. I mean, even though he was raised in a church. How about you? Were you raised in a church? I was not. Uh, I also was raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, just like Gary, and um, I was uh, born to a, well, at that time, she was a single mom of two who was divorced, and my father had just come over from Mexico and was 19 years old, and so they weren't together very long when they had me, never married or anything like that, um, and uh, yeah, I wasn't really raised with either one of them. Uh, we were taken away at a pretty young age, a pretty young age for me. My siblings were a little bit older um, from my mom. And uh, and uh, at the time, you know, she had gotten into drugs and we had an uh, abusive stepfather that came into the picture. And uh, so, yeah. Um, Doesn't sound like a real happy childhood. No, no. That uh, I would say that childhood has been a lifetime of trying to um, escape. Escape what? Just uh, the memories of that childhood, or the pain of that mm. childhood, or just working through it, the trauma. With no church background, no religious background. A little bit. So then. What happened was we, uh, my brother and sister, they went with their father in California. I w uh, was went to a few different family members, but then we were reunited with my grandmother, who ended up raising us, mm -hmm. my mom's mother, uh, and from around six to twelve, five to twelve, somewhere in there, um, and uh, there would be like a church bus that would come along and. You know, pick kids up and give them dilly bars afterwards. And I'd remember hmm. saying some verses for, you know, rewards and things like that. And uh, there was a little bit of church exposure, but a lot of confusion when it when it came to things of God. Yeah. Okay. Well, in that kind of a childhood, did you find some happy things? What did um, you like to do? Yeah. So I would love to go outside. You know, typical eighties, nine. You know, 
80s kid. Um, go outside, play with friends, uh, basically until the street lights came on. To see anybody <laughs> else. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, we were we were very poor, so in a way, I kind of I'm pr- I'm kind of appreciative of that because uh, it's just made me want to work hard for you know anything that that I received and um, just appreciate things more. Yeah. Good. Yeah. What was your schooling experience? Um, yeah, so I was, uh, you kind of bounced around with you know, just uh, different schools there in Indianapolis on the east side um, you know, with my grandmother. But then once I hit uh, 12, 13 years old, I, I wanted to go live with my mother again. Um, she had been, you know, what I didn't mention, she had been a heroin addict. Um, and so that's part of the reason we were also taken away. But at this point, she then got in a methadone clinic and was all methadone. So, um, but I always just, I wanted to know my mom. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I ran away from my grandmother to go live with my mom uh, just before eighth grade and uh, on my last day of school, seventh grade. And uh, yeah, she had a different husband at this point. Um, so she, Still a methadone addict, still an alcoholic. He was also an alcoholic, but it's not the best of um, surroundings. But uh, but you know she was more stable than mm-hmm. in the past. And did, did that affect you as far as drugs and alcohol is concerned as a teenager? So yeah, I'd say the way it affected me is that my my grandmother, boy, she really you know uh, if you're raised, raised with a grandma, she just uh, was she cared and and was strict and you know we she knew what we were doing but (laughs) as soon as I got with my mom she was kind of the cool older sister that just didn't mind so much if I was out all night you know I I actually did my first drugs with my mother oh um so yeah um it was just a totally different concept of of raising me did your first drugs with your mother most people are hiding their drugs from their mother (laughs) (laughs) yeah no (laughs) no and uh, actually my father did re-enter the picture at that point um i did i looked up my my dad and um and found him and um so we kind of had an an on and off relationship at that time just uh you know i was still getting to know my mom so um Hmm. you know okay well, um, what were your what were your high school years like? Were they pretty settled? Were they tumultuous? Were you behaving yourself? No, I no. Mean, I started off emphatic like, trying no. to be the <laughs> trying to be the the good girl that I maybe was when I was younger. You know, getting good grades and things like that, um, cheerleading, different things. You know, but uh, but then I just um, I would say I started looking for love in all the wrong places. Mm. and uh, just went boy crazy and um, yeah just kind of got myself into trouble I ended up pregnant at 16 years old um, with my oldest son and early on in that pregnancy I didn't know what I was going to do but I knew that there was a there's a crisis pregnancy center around the corner from our house so I knew that described me because it had, it had it had the word crisis in it, hmm. and uh, I didn't know that they were a Christian ministry or anything like that. They actually gave me my first tract. I still have it taped in his baby book. Wow! I have to bring that. Hmm. Um, but I never really read it. I just taped it in his baby book because it was from them. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they just they did a sonogram, showed me a video, just kind of you know that this was. A baby, you know, and uh, pretty much saved his life. It changed your uh, thinking about changed my thinking about, about your pregnancy. How were you thinking about the baby before the sonogram? I think I was just thinking, you know, this is just a bunch of. It, it doesn't matter, you know, what I choose. It's just a bunch of tissue cells, you know. Um, maybe deep down, I there's part of me that knew that mm. it could be more than that, mm-hmm. but. But you can't argue with a video no, of a no, sonogram. No, and then honestly, even the pamphlets they handed out back then just um, were very graphic and and uh, 
How old is Zach now? Zach is 30 now. 30? I had him at 16 years old and a month before I turned 17. And actually when I was pregnant with Zach, I did end up, um, I I missed a lot of school my junior year um, during that pregnancy. A lot of drama surrounding um, this boy. And so, um, so yeah, I missed a lot of school, went to truancy court and ended up in juvenile for like, you know, a few weeks uh, during my pregnancy. And that scared me so much that I went back my senior year and went to day and night school to graduate on time after mm-hmm. I was born. So. Truancy means you've just been skipping school? I had been skipping school. Like crazy. Yeah. And it's honestly, I'm so glad they did that because I would have probably never graduated high school had mm-hmm. I not done that. Okay. So you got out of high school. You got a baby. <clears throat> and... Um, was Gary come in this picture yet or I know it was pretty yes, soon Gary, after high school, wasn't it? Yes. So I had just graduated high school. Uh, two weeks later, I met Gary. He was uh, fresh off the scene. <laughs> fresh <laughs> off the scene. <laughs> That's a euphemism if I ever heard one. <laughs> right. Um, and Zach was somewhere between nine, ten months old. Um, it was May of uh, 93. Zach was born July of 92. So that's, yeah, I met Gary, I think he's about 10 months old. How'd you meet him? Through, in our apartment complex that I lived in, uh, he was over at a mutual friend's house. And, um, oh, I love how he told the story. Ooh, this is my chance. This, okay. This, yes, yes. Your yes. shot. You did mention telling the truth. So he mentioned that I had a boyfriend. I would say he wasn't there just for a friend. <laughs> so... So yeah, um, we both were kind of seeing other people at the time and, and just, you know, uh, hit it off. Okay. So you, you, you hit it off pretty well with him. We did. And you, yeah. then you got married and live happily ever after. Yes. Yeah. It's exactly the end of the story right there. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, we got married about a year later and it was actually only a month after we were married. Um, we got married July is around my birthday in August that we were ready to call it quits. One month. Get it mm. um, just, yeah, honestly, um, he was, I remember him actually trying to witness to me during this time, mm. kind of sharing the gospel with me. But he was doing all the same things I was at that point. Mm-hmm. And I, the only exposure that I had, you know, to anything of God was very workspace you know um, you if you're saved you should be showing that by your lifestyle um, and he definitely I wouldn't say he was really fitting that mold so so that affected his the impact of his witness on you did you didn't take him seriously no. because of his lifestyle right exactly yeah. Yeah. well I don't no one would blame you I think yeah. You know, we usually have to back up our words with our our lifestyle and our deeds. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I he would. I was just very uh, sarcastic. I think in my response to him, like, so you're telling me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you could just go out and do this, and you're still safe, you know. I just I couldn't believe it. Okay. <laughs> so you, you had some issues. You almost almost split up after one month, but y'all de- decided evidently to keep on plugging. Yes, yeah, so we did, we, we separated. We were thinking of getting divorced after a month in the, or annulment, and uh, by October, by his birthday, which I always joke, he broke up for my birthday, he didn't have to get me anything. We, <laughs> we were definitely back by his birthday. Huh. <laughs> gonna, you think all that was calculated, I huh? think it was calculated. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, by October of his birthday, uh, we were back together and uh, just realizing it was a mistake. And what what's funny, Charlie, is that uh, the town that we were married in, uh, Pittsburgh, they sent out these those big old family Bibles that were inscribed with a family name mm-hmm. after you were married in that town. Mm-hmm. And so we were kind of divvying things up at that point. You just, you know, he, he would come over and from and give me things that we received as wedding gifts or whatever you know just divvying it up just what do we do with this so you weren't living together we weren't living together okay Mm-mm. and uh, he brought that bible over 
It's like, I thought you might need this. <laughs> And extra extra large size. Yes, extra large size. Uh, that's what got us talking again, was when he brought that Bible over, that we just actually started talking again, and uh, just thinking about what we were doing, and, and actually went out on a date and started dating again. And, um, so it's it. we look back at that now, we still have it, and look back at that now, just how God was working, even in the early days. Just. Doesn't sound like uh, a lot of your life was very happy. That you no, kind of, no. I mean, you're, the whole time you're talking here, you got a big smile on your face, but it doesn't sound like you had the kind of life where you were smiling very much. No, um, I think my way of getting through a lot of that um, was just to disassociate, you know, myself from it, just to almost um, kind of, you know, talk about the past or or think about the past as if it were someone else hmm. so I definitely had to do some work in uh, counseling and that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't until after I became a believer so uh, hmm. when Gary and I got back together a few months later he you, you heard on his story that right. he went over to this uh, pastor's home mm -hmm. and um, just got his relationship he was a prodigal so he got his relationship just right with the Lord. Um, and uh, I noticed such a difference in him that within four days I wanted whatever it was he had. Hmm. Uh, I did, and so I was walking over to the payphone as he mentioned in his story uh, back when there were payphones. Yeah. It was actually next to a bar. And, uh, and calling that same pastor up and saying, you know, I, I know I have the man of my dreams now, but uh, there's something I'm missing. And he asked me that question, you know, well, if you were to die today and and God were to ask you why I would lay in my heavens, what would you say? And I said, I'd tell him you probably shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. And he said, like, why don't you just come on over? My wife and I will be up for a while. And um, he took the time, or they took the time, to, like, put a Bible in my lap and show me um, from the Bible just... Um, that none of us are good enough to be saved and that it is a gift uh, from that's the whole reason that jesus came and died and rose again was because we couldn't do it on our own and so it just it's almost like the scales fall off, fell off that night just that um that even i could be saved hmm. yeah i think a lot of people can relate to that who have difficult upbringings or regular upbringings and you used to living in a world where you have to earn everything mm -hmm. and work for everything and then somebody tells you that you can have something the best thing in the world eternal life for absolutely free and you don't believe it but what's what's amazing to me in your story is that here uh, Gary is witnessing to you and you're not interested at all because his lifestyle as soon as his lifestyle changes you're asking someone about how to be saved so lifestyle yeah. makes a big difference in our impact with people. That's the lesson I hope that we can take away from that. It One does. Point. It does. <laughs> What's funny is, uh, though, uh, after after I was saved, and he mentioned I was the first convert in this new uh, church plant that this pastor was was planting, and um, we stayed there for a couple years and, and uh, worked with. I started off learning the Bible stories, like working with twos and threes, you know, I'm just like reading them the Bible stories, like this is amazing, you know, just <laughs> <laughs> learning myself Good. Uh, at 19 years old. And then, um, and then we started working with youth and the plan uh, was we were gonna go off to World Life Bible Institute for a year and come back and, and work in that church plant on the side mm -hmm. um, of our jobs. So, well, somewhere in that year of going to World Life Bible Institute, you know, God just really works in Gary's heart about just continuing his education and full-time ministry. And that's where I think we had this little bit of crisis, so to speak, that um, I was thinking, there, I've never heard of a pastor's wife with a background like mine, you know, a single mom, all this stuff. And I was just, I was afraid, like, mm. how, how can God possibly use us in full-time ministry oh, welcome welcome to the human race <laughs> exactly you're, you're actually one of us <laughs> exactly yeah 
Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> I'm so thankful for uh, a professor's wife, uh, Betsy Calhoun. She would come over weekly and give me tests out of Let's Know the Bible just so that I would so that Gary wasn't just learning and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm only taking a class at a time at this point because we have we have uh, two children yeah. at home. Mm-hmm. And uh, she uh, she would come over and, and give me tests and, and try to get me to, to learn the Bible. But she was the one who really just kind of talked to me about this is, these are the stories that God uses. Mm-hmm. Um, that God can use your life. Well, yeah, look at the characters in the Bible. You have every kind of issue, every kind of background with people. Exactly. And yet God uses people like that. Definitely. So, um, then, yeah, go ahead. And then, uh, yeah, we went. On, he went on to uh, to West Virginia and finished school out there at uh, Appalachian Bible College. Um, and we went into ministry. And what I was going to say was funny, was you, know, you were talking about lifestyle and... Um, you know, just his lifestyle kind of matching what he was, you know, giving me basically just, you know, uh, with the, with the gospel of, of what I thought, like I thought the gospel was, you know, all workspace. And so I thought he'd be this squeaky clean, you know, person, you know, once he was saved. And, um, what happened with me is after we got into ministry, I think I, I just became the role, didn't, and kind of almost lost myself, so to speak. Um, you became a pastor's wife exactly. instead of being Chayla Armstrong. Right, right. So well, that was a, that. That was the question that's kind of I've been waiting to ask here. Did he ever ask you if you wanted to go into ministry full time? Did you just have that discussion? He did, and so I think he was really patient with me at Word of Life as I was, as I was working through, you know, whether or not, you know, I, we could go into full time ministry. He wasn't like, well, you know, just kind of beating me over the head, just you know, like, hey, it's, it's okay, you know, uh, you know, we should do this, and God told me we should do that. But you know, he just he. So you were a willing follower. I was eventually. Eventually. <laughs> eventually, I would say <laughs> I was quite so willing in the beginning, but oh, okay. once once I felt like God could use us, then I definitely uh, was a lot more willing. I remember when I asked Karen to marry me, I I tried to paint the worst picture I could of what the ministry is like. I said we'll probably not have any money, might not even be able to buy a house, yeah. and, and that's that's how I painted it for her, mm-hmm. just so that she would. Uh, go in with her eyes open but God's been yeah. good to us in many ways and I, I don't think she has any regrets even though she said she'd never marry a pastor wow and look at her now <laughs> yeah look at her now <laughs> right. um, so you uh, some being you part of a church plant and going to school mm-hmm. uh, I know that that the financial strain on you on you both yeah. but that's a faith builder that's a faith building exercise did you see a lot of things happened that really did strengthen your faith along the way? We did. And I would say especially that first year in New York. Uh, I mean, we both quit jobs to go up there. And, and um, you know, I was just like working part-time at the snack shack at Word of Life. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And he was, you know, part-time bookstore and things like that. But, um, but yeah, it's just it, it's a lot of faith and a lot of support from the home church and just um, family and different things that uh, helped us you know, get the education and, and go and uh, be there and just, it really built our faith. And I had the idea that New York was going to be like New York, New York, you know, just big mm, city, yeah. lots of people. You get up there in upstate New York and all distractions are gone. I mean, you're burning your trash. It's all distractions are gone. Yeah. And so it just, I think that solitude with the Lord was so needed that year mm-hmm. was one of the one of the best ways to build my faith yeah after paul got saved he went into the wilderness for two or three years and he didn't doesn't tell us what he did but just yeah. being in the wilderness you can guess he had a lot of solitude so yeah. i think the lord knows that we need that kind of thing in our lives yeah so definitely. so what is the what is the thing you like best about being um i won't say about being gary's wife i'll say about being a pastor's <laughs> wife so 
being a that, pastor. That even wife. characterizing you as a pastor's wife is not really a good thing to do. Right. What do you like best about b being close to the ministry? Because they actually, you know, the church didn't hire you. Right. So, and you don't play the piano. So. Yes, I do not. <laughs> so, what, what, so do, you, what do you enjoy best I'm about sorry, ministry? Professor, but yes. I, <laughs> now, I, I enjoy uh, things like that. Just being able to pass along um, God's goodness um, to us and, and the lives of other people and, and, just being able to even be a part of being used by him is uh, is very humbling, you know. Um, I'd say a lot of the work he's done in my life has been in the last seven years, um, especially just kind of coming into more of the free grace um, circles. Explain that. Well, because I, as I mentioned before, I. I kind of started losing myself in the ministry where, you know, I, I can be, I can be a rule follower. I can be, you know, and that's, I think, you know, early on, like I mentioned, I, I wanted to see that from Gary, the rule following. The, um, I, I think just, most Christians are in there where you're describing. Yes. They think and, they're following rules and being good Christians because they're doing the right things. Exactly. So even when you're in ministry or your pastor's wife or some type of leader, it's so easy to to fall into that that mold of expectation on externals sometimes and uh i think i i enjoy just maybe playing a role and just meeting expectations okay if you lead a bible study or if you you know sing up front or if you do the do things you're fulfilling your your duty or your role um and it's easy to maybe equate that with your spiritual walk with Jesus. Right. And so this last, you know, I'd say seven or whatever years, as we become more um, in the free grace circles, I learned that even in leadership, you know, as we went to New Braunfels Bible, um, right. even in leadership, you're free to be yourself. And people are going to, kind of ask you how you're doing and like really they they care like you know they want you to be genuine mm -hmm. um and you don't have to fake it it's okay to show your mistakes and it's okay to be vulnerable and i don't know that i ever felt so vulnerable as i have in these circles um and so at first it kind of crushed me i was like i i i was almost you know just I didn't decide myself not knowing okay well who who am I really mm -hmm. you know uh, where am I in my walk with Jesus really um, and so it just it, I had to do a lot of digging deep and, and kind of dealing with some of the past trauma and things like that of, um, you know just uh, <coughs> the pain from that and just the scars that that left and being okay with being myself because I don't know that I was ever comfortable being myself and I think that was an issue well ha have you also been found that you're drawing upon your past negative experiences useful in ministry or sharing with those th that those things with people and using them to help people now I have been more open about it it's just it's been a uh, it's been a process getting there. That's, those are things I just didn't, uh, you know, share as often or utilize in the past because, uh, like I said, I just kind of distanced myself from it. Once I got away from it, I left it all behind. Mm -hmm. um, so it hasn't been until more, you know, recent years that I've even really started kind of opening up about those things. Mm. Well, grace does make a difference. It, it, one incident in the Bible that I think is uh, interesting is that when Jesus was baptized, the Father's voice said, Behold, you know, my Son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus hadn't even started his ministry yet, but he was pleased with his Son because he was his Son, not because he did anything. And, and I think what you're 
saying something similar. I love that. It seems that, you know, you. I think that grace teaches us that God loves us because of who we are, yeah. not because of what we do. Yeah, and that freedom that you receive when you really realize that, <laughs> um, that He loves you as you are, who you are, um, you know, right where you are, and it's 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 life changing. Um, so yeah, it's it's really um, I don't know. It's, I guess it just wanted calls me to dig deeper in um, my relationship with God and just want more. Great, and you're gonna be participating to participating in a conference soon talking to young girls and younger girls yes it looks about like things. that may be postponed a little bit but uh yes uh, mothers and daughters yeah we're going to be um our church is going to be hosting a a conference that ta tackles tough topics for teenagers mm -hmm. <laughs> tongue twister <laughs> tough topics for teenagers um uh, yeah and specifically for for young women um and you know, just kind of who they are, their identity, and um, a lot of these things that young women struggle with, um, you know, where we try to find our worth. And so, yeah, it's going to be sharing my story with them. That's great. So, uh, you have, digressing a little bit or just changing the subject a little bit, you have uh, you, a love for animals and a lot of pets. Yes. Tell us briefly about your... Um, menagerie of animals yes um we have two miniature horses and that i mean this has just been since 2021 do you have to like put one foot on each one and ride them yeah how like, do you ride we miniature actually horses? do not ride them uh they're just strictly pets uh we yeah we have a boy and a girl and then we have two little goats um miniature goats miniature nubians and then uh two bunnies and three dogs. We just add our third, added our third dog uh, this past year. Okay. During that whole <laughs> cancer struggle. Well, I say more power to you. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of caretaking. <laughs> yeah, it's it is definitely a lot, but. Uh, <clears throat> oh, that's good. So that's kind of like a hobby for you. It is. You know, I've always I have always loved animals. It's just you know, again. Uh, you can trust them and uh, you know there when the times i couldn't necessarily trust people to be mm -hmm. there for me like you can always trust animals <laughs> they just seem to be you know that's that's very true i always tell people i like animals too with a little gravy but anyway <laughs> oh. that's a that's a bad joke right. wrong person let's <laughs> is there anything else you want to tell us about where your life is headed or how your life is going right now yeah um so I would say just this past uh, this this past year um, uh, in April of 2022, I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer, um, and didn't really have a lot of symptoms leading up to, it, or at least that I knew of symptoms leading up to it. Um, some weight loss, some nausea, and things, but um, yeah, I was diagnosed on tax day. Uh, of last year, 2022, and then quickly went into uh, surgery in May, and uh, and then went through six months of chemo, and finished in November, and currently in remission. But I think the reason uh, that has been such a game changer for me, I guess, um, of just really purposefully trying to get close to the Lord and just draw near to him is because uh, Gary's telling me yesterday <clears throat> you know with all of the things that happened in my past I didn't really value life like there were it just, it just, life was so painful that um, I fantasized death more than I did life mm. even, even sometimes as a believer just struggled with that um with just my purpose here and just again being a burden on everyone around me and just you know wanting to just just not be around anymore hmm. sometimes um so it was it's it's always been a struggle 
Um, Are you saying your experience with cancer has changed that perspective? Yes. yes. About life um, itself? About life itself, yes. To really, I think God is really teaching me, still teaching me, to appreciate every day that He's given because uh, because I didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm finally like learning to just you know, appreciate my time here and really um, wanting to glorify Him with this time. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's true. You know, especially you know, people have experienced tough experiences, and they're th- thankful to be alive. And also, um, when you, people get older and they realize their days are limited, they start paying a little more attention to the people around them. Unfortunately, yeah. sometimes it's too little, too late. But yeah, we often true. take people in life for granted. That's true. So it's good to hear that that's going on with, with in your thinking. Yeah. Um, well, we had just a little bit of time left. Anything else you want to mention? I sure do love my husband. Yeah, you got <laughs> got to throw that in. He's, you know, and, he's just, he's and your other children, Zach yes, is Zach, thir- thirty. Yes, Zach is thirty, uh, and his wife Kenzie. They are just um, they're down in New Braunfels. Uh, huge blessing. Our middle son Keaton and his wife Annie up in St. Louis. Um, we we joke that we. Our church planners in that we leave children everywhere we go. Every ministry <laughs> we've been in, we just leave children behind, and so that's how we're planning. <laughs> okay. Um, no. uh, so Keaton and Annie are up in St. Louis, and then Garrett and Laura are still here uh, in Burleson with us. Okay, that's good. Now, if somebody's listening, some young lady's listening, and she's chosen some, made some bad decisions in life. She's had problems. She's covered with guilt. She really doesn't feel the love of God. She thinks people are looking down on her, judging her. Can you give give a brief word to someone like that? Mm. Yeah, I would say that uh, God does absolutely love you, and um, you can trust Him. His character is true. What the Bible says is absolutely true about Him. And uh, we sometimes... Um, suppress or hold down that truth because we just we we want to believe what we want to believe and uh, we we don't want to believe that there's maybe someone who who could love us uh, in that state you know that we feel that we're in um, but he he loves us so much that he he sent his son to die for us and uh, and he definitely um, he definitely sees us, you know, when no one else does, he sees us, um, he sees that pain, he doesn't waste it, um, he holds our tears on bottles, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he, he can absolutely use, um, use you. Huh. Well, Chayla, I know, uh, I would call you a trophy of grace that God has done wonderful things in your life. And and your life is pouring out, spilling over into the lives of those around you now. And I know that Burleson Bible Church is happy to have you and Gary mm-hmm. very much. And they, they treasure your relationship and Thank your friendship you. and your ministry to them. Although it's, we're not paying you for your ministry, paying Gary for his. <laughs> so you, you're free to do whatever you want. That's a nice thing about being a pastor's wife. You can do whatever you want. It's the best. Or you don't do it. Or you don't have to do anything. <laughs> yes, Nothing's yes. expected of you. Isn't that neat? It is very neat. <laughs> so anyway, it's been a nice conversation. Thanks for talking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So that's Chayla Armstrong's story, and you can get a hold of her probably through Gary Armstrong if you contact Burleson Bible Church. I think it's Gary at BurlesonBibleChurch.org. Get a hold of her that way if you had a question or something for her. It's been, it's been great to sit and chat with her and see how God has worked in her life. Um, and I trust that God is also using her words to work in your life as well, to reassure you that His love is, is constant and continual and ever-present and always available. And the grace of our God in Jesus Christ and what He did for us on the cross is available for anyone and can change lives even today. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, right now would be a good time to do that. Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross and paying the price for my sins and rising from the dead. And I want to trust Him as my Savior right now. And just thank Him for the eternal life that He gives as a result of that. 
And then share this podcast with someone that you know that would, would enjoy hearing it or needs to hear it. And, um, and give us a comment or two on, on the line, on the, the podcast line that you're listening to, um, app, whatever, and more people will hear it. So thank you. God bless you. Until all here.